Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground. I'm Malva Kajali, the events assistant here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today when we're joined by curator and author Nico Whedon in conversation with cultural leaders and all around fabulous panel, Shonda Chapman, Jamaica Gilmer, and Miguel Luciano in celebration of Nico's forthcoming book from Roman and Littlefield Publishing. We're also so lucky today to have the poet Sadia Hassan here with us who will read to close this afternoon's program. So looking forward to that. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wapinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. We'd also like to recognize that white settler colonialism is part of a continual legacy of white supremacy in this country. and. Uh, that it has many nuanced and not so nuanced expressions. And so before we get started, we'd like to take a moment to honor the memory of all those we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country, let alone in the last year, um, as well as to honor those who are working to undo these legacies of violence and disinvestment. Uh, we acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our interlocutors, uh, I invite you to join us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Um, and now, uh, to introduce today's special guests, Shonda Chapman is the director of the Girls Fund Initiative of the Miss Foundation. And she's worked as a lead program specialist on national initiatives aimed at preventing and ending girls incarceration at the Vera Institute of Justice. Before this, she served as director of the Beyond the Bars Fellowship Program at the Center for Justice at Columbia. Her work has focused on racial justice, gender justice, and understanding the ways girls of color get pushed into the criminal justice system. Today, she is joined by strategist, storyteller, photographer, and curator, Jamaica Gilmer, who's the founder and director of The Beautiful Project, an arts collective that centers Black women and girls as the authority over their own narratives. Her work as a storyteller and photographer allow her to capture realities that are overlooked and misunderstood. And she was also the lead curator of a beautiful exhibition uh, featuring The Beautiful Project that was at the Met just a year ago, and which you can check out in the chat. I'll drop the link right now. Um, joining them is Miguel Luciano, a multimedia visual artist whose work explores themes of history, popular culture, social justice, and migration through sculpture, painting, and socially engaged public art projects. He teaches at SVA and Yale School of Art and is currently an artist in residence within the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Civic Practice Partnership Residency Program. Uh, so glad to have you tuning in. And finally, they will be in conversation with independent art advisor, curator, educator, and writer, Nico Whedon. Uh, Nico, take it away. Wow, hey. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. I'm like poking around to see who all is in the room. It's so amazing to be surrounded by so many friends and family. Um, and also thank you all new folks who I'm just getting to know today. Um, yeah, this is gonna be a really fun conversation. I invite everyone to show up as their full self. Please drop all sorts of comments, affirmations, questions uh, in the chat throughout our conversation. We do want this to be an engaging program today. Um, so yeah, first I just wanna thank Nick and Malvika and Fong and Charlie and everyone at BR for really offering up this platform today. Um, the Brooklyn Rail has been like a long supporter of my work, but also the work of other people that I care about. So thank y'all. Um, and thank you for continually showing up. I appreciate you. Um, and Malvika, I feel like I just want to listen to your voice all day. So I don't know if we can arrange that, but let's work on it. Um, so yeah, uh, it's true. I wrote a book. I'm writing a book. That's part of like the artifice for how we all arrive here, but that's like not at all what I really want to focus on today. Um, I'm just really excited to be in conversation with these three brilliant minds and people in the world that I'm proud to call friends um, that are also part of the community of the book. Um, so the book, still working title, uh, again, we'll get to this later, brings together 40 voices from the field, um, really utilizing the roundtable format 
um, to kind of interrogate, share tools from radical practice that's taking place within, beyond, and through the museum space. Um, so not in any way wanting to anchor it to museums, but hoping to offer up tools that empower museums who in this moment are looking to make significant changes um, to really see like where the work is already happening and where the work is already advancing the social change that they wanna be a part of. Um, so in terms of flow today, um, it's gonna be pretty, pretty fluid. Um, I'm gonna introduce our speakers through some personal anecdotes. So please be prepared to be embarrassed. Um, and then for roughly an hour, we're gonna discuss civic practice, mentorship, and the importance of FUBU institutions. That's for us, by us, for folks that don't know. Um, and then we're gonna open up the floor to Q&A, which I hope will actually be a Q&A. Um, we also have plenty of questions for each other, I'm sure, but we wanna welcome you into the discussion. Um, and then we'll close with a poem by Sadia Hassan. I'm so excited to see what you're gonna read with us today. Um, and that should take us to, I don't know, what do we say, two hours? Um, so yeah, here we go. Uh, Miguel, can you give us a wave? All right, so I don't even know where to start with Miguel. Um, I feel as though, and this might not be true, um, but I'm pretty sure I met you like within the first week of moving to New York. So imagine like a 21 year old Nico moving to New York to like pursue a career in the arts without having any clue what that means. Um, and so, yeah, at the time, I think I was at Rush Arts Gallery. You and Zach rocked up with a basketball and like challenged me, right? Well, we were so trying to convince you to come play, exactly. Yeah. And you so played and you could play, so we were always like, okay, come with us, come with us. I know, and I was like, I'm working, but yeah, after, <laughs> after five. Um, yeah, and I just, I feel so fortunate to have met you so early on in my journey, I think, you know, it's not often, and this is still the case, that I find peers that really kind of lead from this values-driven, community-driven place in every aspect of their work. Um, and so that felt like a really important affirmation to kind of like find in another person that early in my career. So thank you for that and for like continually being yourself in everything that you do. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, just in terms of how Miguel shows up in the book, um, he's in the very first roundtable discussion alongside Jordan Castile, Sean Leonardo, and Lena Puerta. It felt really important to me to like start the book with this artist's perspective um, and an artist's critique of institutions, specifically cultural and arts institutions. Um, and we just like lay it all out there. We had a really transparent conversation about you know, like the challenges and opportunities of the kind of museum residency format, um, but also like the invisible labor that artists perform, you know, within and around institutions um, and really helping to bridge community. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, the official framing of Miguel's participation. But I think, like I said, I think you show up in the book in lots of other ways, um, just in terms of the work that you're doing in community. Um, and in particular, your critique of forest bias institutions. I think that's like a hard thing to do out loud. Um, mm -hmm. We know that we love our institutions, but it's also through that love that we're able to critique them. Mm -hmm. um, so I just appreciate all the perspectives that you show up with today. Um, so thank you for being in the book. Thank, thank you for, for all the work me. that you make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My pleasure to be here. And by the way, Nico is a baller. So uh, we found that out quickly. Yeah, she's dangerous if you leave her alone beyond the arc. <laughs> Yeah, watch out. Although now I'm just old, so I'll fall over, but yeah, mm -hmm. in my day. Um, okay, Jamaica, where are you? Can you give us a wave? I'm here. Hi. I'm trying to get my view right so I can, there you go. Um, okay, so this is my anecdote for how I know Jamaica. You know those contexts where you're like asked to be in a room and you're not really sure why you're there, but there's a lot of people and out of like many, many strangers, you find yourself drawn to somebody. Perhaps it's their energy. Um, most likely it's what they're talking about. I can't even remember what drew me to you. I think it was probably the intensity with which you talk about your work. Um, and I mean that in the best possible way. Um, but yeah, I just remember launching into conversation with you as though I had known you forever which was not the case because we don't live in the same place. I had not met you. Um, we were both at the Met as part of the Keenan cohort. So there was 20 other um, kind of grantees under this grant um, from the Keenan Charitable Trust. And, you know, we were like navigating what social impact might look like as a collective endeavor. 
Um, but as kind of like functional strangers in a space, right? And so I just really appreciated the vulnerability that you brought to that space. I think sharing everything about how you established and continue to like just cultivate the beautiful project um, and talking about, you know, the difficulties of leadership, the difficulties of mentorship, the difficulties of holding forest bias institutions with everything that's going on. Um, I just really appreciate the work that you do. Um, and I just love that moment. I just love remembering meeting you because I was like, oh, we're sisters, but we're strangers, but it doesn't matter, it's cool. And you didn't treat me like I was crazy. So thank you. <laughs> you weren't, thank you. Thank okay. You. Yeah. <laughs> you, um, I remember you, um, I, we did, we had this like kind of collaborative speaking um, engagement. And I remember after I shared a lot about my life and about the beautiful project and the amazing women and girls in it, um, you screamed, um, I just came off the stage and you screamed, when are we hanging out? And I was like, I'll love her forever. This is the best response to anything I've ever done. Uh, Cause I meant it. <laughs> So yeah, thank you so much. Um, Jamaica shows up in the book, um, part two of the book of which there's three altogether, um, which is museum innovation, creative and cultural entrepreneurship um, in and around the museum space. And so it's really a section about looking again at the work that's already happening on the ground that museums can learn from, um, but also just like, you know, simple things like how you lead from a place of values, how you structure your day in such a way that there's never a question around who you serve and how you serve them. Um, and so in your round table, um, you feature alongside Kimmy Ilisami from the Laundromat Project and Shawnee Peters from the Black School. And at some point we like forgot that we were even really <laughs> trying to provide direct tools to people. Um, because, you know, it really was just about sharing a transparent experience um, and one that was, you know, both kind of riddled with challenges, but also beautiful moments of triumph um, that others can learn from. So thank you again for your participation in the book, for all your work and for being here. Can we do like a virtual, a virtual love on Jamaica? Okay, Shonda, can you give us a wave? Yeah, okay. So um, it should be said, Jamaica introduced me to Shonda. So if you have any <laughs> sense from that alone, what our first conversation might have looked like. Um, I just remember being, we have not met in person. This is like a Zoom love affair. Um, and I just remember our first conversation, which was kind of pre book round table discussion, just like leaning closer and closer into the Zoom to like try and be nearer to you, which is not how that works, but I was just so compelled by the energy and the enthusiasm and the excitement that you bring to the work, especially the work of philanthropy now, right? Like I think it's it's exciting to know someone who has dedicated their career to movement work and then is showing up in philanthropy as like an extension of that work, right? Um, and so I'm just super amazed by the work that you do. Your roundtable, which featured Ruby Lerner and Melissa Kelly Wolf. We also like went in, um, but we were looking really at systems and structures and like how we can actually imagine change um, on a daily kind of level and like what leadership looks like and what leadership needs to look like as a daily practice to kind of get us there. Um, and so just excited to like imagine this conversation between these three folks who feature in different parts of the book, but are kind of bound by a similar set of values, a similar set of agreements to community um, and by work that is like different, but you know, I think feels similar in terms of its impact. Um, so that's the introduction to why we're all here today. Um, I wanted to take just a little bit of time to frame it so that people know, um, but now we can forget all of that and just kind of move into talking as people. Um, and so we said that we were gonna start with civic practice. And I think that it's a kind of grounding, let's have like a moment of grounding definitions and terms for folks. Um, I think I named community as being kind of central in all of our work. And I'm just hoping each of you can go around and just define like who the communities are that you identify with um, and how civic practice shows up as a way of both kind of serving and engaging those communities. I realize this is an open-ended question. Um, and so let's try and find some like nuance to drill down on together. And it's, I'm not gonna name y'all, so just jump in whenever you're, 
whenever you're ready. I'm so moved by these like personal introductions. Oh, thanks. They're yeah, just such it's a, a nice lot of way love. of setting setting the stage. It's all yeah. love. Uh, I just want to say, Nico, thank you for the introduction. I, I feel like I got invited to a cool people party that like, I'm like, did they, am I the one who they wanted to invite? That, They're that. so cool. <laughs> a fangirl a little bit every time I talk to sort of each one of you guys. Um, thank you for sort of starting um, with sort of asking us to talk about our identity, right? Because it's one of the things that I like to start sort of any conversation that I have about work um, because our positionality like absolutely matters. And so I, I like to start with identifying the fact that I am a cisgender woman, um, a woman who, uh, a black woman who was the descendant of slaves in this country, um, someone who is from a Southern working class family background. I identify as a queer woman, as a fat woman. Um, I identify as a mother. Um, I'm someone who is a survivor, um, someone who has experienced the justice system directly. And all of these identities sort of impact both the work that I choose to do and my orientation to the work, um, especially my commitment to dismantling systems of oppression, um, but also as creating joy and beauty sort of as resistance to that oppression. I can go. Um... So I am Ida and Steve's daughter, and that has meant um, more and more to me. Um, so I have been um, identifying most particularly at this moment on the in the world um, with daughters, um, uh, with Black people, and people who love them. Um, with folks who are struggling uh, with their bodies not being what they used to be, um, not being able to move like they could because of an injury. Um, so that's where I've, that, that's how I'm answering this question uh, right now. It's different than how I used to um, answer the question before. Um, but in this, uh, in the midst of all of the uh, kind of scary quiet that's happened in the world, um, it's, it, it's what feels good right now. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I want to, uh, thank you, Nico, again, for bringing us together, um, in the, the book and in this, uh, occasion today. Um, so I, uh, I'm a visual artist and, um, I'm based in New York. I live and work in East Harlem. Um, have a studio in Bushwick for like the last 20 years. Um, and as an artist, I, I think about making work that uh, connects with uh, the communities that I live and work in. I mean, I've always sort of had a practice that thinks about um, how important that is. And so I live in East Harlem, which is, you know, the sort of the center of the, of the Puerto Rican community in New York, symbolic center of the Puerto Rican community in New York's history. Um, but I've also had a studio in Bushwick for, I don't know, 20 years. And, you know, my family from Puerto Rico uh, ended up in Brooklyn, you know, in the Bronx and lots of parts of New York that uh, I think that my work sort of sort of retraces in some ways, these different mm -hmm. histories of our migration, and our presence in the city. And um, so, uh, yeah, those are the, these are the communities I feel connected to and also most inspired by um in the work that i do and uh and i you know think about how um how communities and community audiences can be a priority sort of in the work itself right away from institutions like and so this is also thinking about public art socially engaged art in different ways to sort of i think break with uh institutional practices that require the gallery or the institution for art to exist um, so that's what I'm thinking about right now in terms of the communities I feel connected to. Thank you all. Um, yeah, and I guess 
so I'm just wondering if we can maybe bridge some like connections for people because I think we all show up to this space wearing a lot of different hats and identities. Um, and, you know, one that I'm trying to figure out how to like sit in relationship to is activist. Um, it's not a label that I wear like willingly or knowingly. Um, I don't want to co-opt or tokenize like that work because it's important work that I believe is happening in a space that's different than the spaces that I'm I'm showing up in. And so I'm just wondering if we can talk about your relationship to, to movement work, how it shows up in your practice, um, but then how you might also identify, you know, with advocacy, activism, education as a tool for really kind of transforming uh, communities, but also institutions, where you kind of find your way into the social justice lens of our work, if you do. I'm happy to jump in here. So for me, can you hear me first of all? Yeah. You know, this, this device here, it has its own my mind. So I'll just check. You just you. want us to see that cute Bluetooth. That's what you know what? I think, you know what? It, it, it's, it's cute in a way. It also reminds me of my first job at the Jack in the Box. See if anybody's sort of been around a little bit, you know, this is my first job. So I'm, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trauma also, but we're gonna work with oh, it. No. Um, <laughs> so I've been around a little bit um, and it, it's interesting, right? Because I feel like my movement work, my advocacy work, my activism work, um, it sort of is in sort of direct relationship to um, experiences of oppression, experiences of, of resistance, um, this especially sort of rooted in the experience of survivorhood for me. Um, that's one of the identities, sort of the, I, I would say the, the identity of survivorhood, the identity uh, as someone who has been directly impacted by the justice system, were two identities that sort of I'd, I'd learned very early on to cloak. And so, you know, as I sort of moved throughout my life and sort of moved throughout the trajectory of my career, um, you know, in addition to sort of, uh, you know, in, in, in that ascension, I felt an immense amount of gratitude, um, but I also felt that I was failing in a particular way by not being visible around some of those identities, um, especially sort of, um, you know, for young girls who were like one of the like primary constituencies for me. And so I, I started off by sort of doing my own learning, um, you know, and then connecting co to communities that were doing the work. Um, for me, that was first uh, Black Women's Blueprint, an organization who uh, works to end violence against uh, um, women and girls of color, and then connecting into sort of communities that were working to um, end mass incarceration and sort of in, in abolish sort of our criminal legal system through the Center for Justice at Columbia University um, and the Beyond the Bars Fellowship. So my own personal identities, my own personal experiences of oppression were, were pushing me to sort of be more visible and to sort of find ways to sort of sit at the table, especially as those tables sort of, you know, as I moved up, you know, I ended up usually being one of the few people in the room. And so there was something about feeling like a fraud and knowing that I had some unique thing to do that I was best positioned to do. Um, and so I started being vocal about it. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna talk about there? Um, I also think that the identity as activist, it's interesting because I feel like most people I know sort of stumbled into it and necessarily so, and usually based upon mm -hmm. some experience of oppression that they had. Um, so for me, the identity is more, um, it's an orientation to the work than, you know, right. the work itself. Um, when, when I was doing research, I considered myself an activist researcher, um, whereas now I consider myself an activist philanthrop uh, a philanthropist. So it really just informs sort of how I do the work, um, who I think deserves to be at the table, sort of what communities that we will sort of um, you know, that we preference, you know, the fact that we think that communities uh, themselves are the experts of their own experiences, all of those things are related to my identity as activists and my orientation as an activist. That was a long answer, Nico, but I hope we no, got there. <laughs> that was perfect. I'm like, you see why I love her? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was fantastic, Shonda. Um, that was fantastic. Um, I th so for me, you know, like my mom was an activist. And so that was just something we knew from her stories and her training of us in the house. But she had so many identities and therefore we had so many identities and so many things we can relate to that it all just felt like what was necessary for a black girl. 
um, I could really, I can really relate to what Shana was talking about, like, like um, the discomfort with what you felt like you were cloaking. Cause I remember my mom, my mom's dark skinned black woman, um, uh, grandfather's from Jamaica. Like she, we grew up with stories that were just literally, you know, some of her training us included understanding that crosses were burned in her yard from the KKK. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were coming from this very um, intense and raw place, um, walking through the house, hearing a story. And that was just part of the framework for, you know, what to remember and how to move and therefore what do you do in the face of it? Um, so the therefore what do you do in the face right. of it just kind of got um, woven in uh, to my whole life because that's how um, my mom moved. Um, and so it's not at all that she was um, uh, perfect, but the all of the experiences she brought to the table and all the emotions she brought to the table just told me it was all part of it. And that that, that, that was a serious question. So then what do we do? Um, and so as I kind of began to be drawn to images, whether film or photography, it started to move also with the, so then what do I do? Like, what do I see? What do I wanna show? What does this have to do with the person that's in front of me, even as a, even as a kid? Um, and so, you know, that, that um, uh, fantastically joyous, life-changing, tumultuous, terrible, wonderful um, relation with, relationship with her, relationship with the fact that she was a survivor, um, okay. relationship with the fact that she was an activist, relation with, relationship with the fact that she thought she was, was not good enough, relationship with the fact that she thought she was the baddest thing walking. And all of those things <laughs> working together um, kind of steamrolled into several things, but one was a revelation after her death um, that I wanted to impact Black girls through photography. So that was kind of like, part of, um, it's, a, it's a big part of how I got to uh, activist, activist as an identity, but also something that I don't, I, it was like, it was like, I know who I am, but I don't want to mess up what folks are out here doing in these streets. And so like, okay. I, I will back up off of that um, mm -hmm. term, um, out of this kind of commitment to making sure the um, making sure who needs to be at the forefront is at the forefront, um, but the reality is it's it, it's always been a part of my training and identity, and so it it has um, become very much so a part of all of my work, um, whether through um, uh, image making, um, image activism. Um, uh, or mothering? Um, for me, I think that um, the like the relationship between art and activism, it feels like I've been thinking about it as we're talking, like it's, it's always been there in the, in so many of the examples that I saw around me, uh, you know, in terms of our, uh, Puerto Rican arts and cultural organizations, they've always been involved and invested in, in, uh, in the politics, you know, of our history. And, uh, and so much of it, uh, those, you know, those organizations started in the late 60s, um, uh, really as an outgrowth of the civil rights movement and um, in, a, in a consciousness that was about uh, challenging colonialism and sort of reclaiming space uh, and empowering our identity. And so that generation, I think, really uh, helped shape uh, our, you know, my experience and, and the experience of my generation in many ways. Um, but I also had, you know, people in my family that were socially and politically engaged always. And so we, un like, I, I just understood growing up that um, that was something that you did and uh, that you invested in, right? Whether it was like getting civically involved, socially involved. Um, my, I came from a family that was very much like that in, in Puerto Rico, especially. Um, but um, I also just did a project, like uh, a big project about the activist history of East Harlem and about the Young Lords, who's uh, called Mapping Resistance, uh, the Young Lords in El Barrio. And 
uh, a couple of years ago was the 50 year, 50 year anniversary of this history and of the uh, founding of the New York chapter of the Young Lords in 69. And that was kind of an amazing experience to look at sort of the arc of this history of activism in our community, right? 50 years later and look at, you know, how radical that work was in, in our neighborhood in 69, but also how some of these same issues that we're still sort of fighting for um, are still in play, right? So they, you know, they were mobilizing around issues of health, food, education, housing, um, which are still crisis issues like in our neighborhood 50 years later. Um, but they were also very invested um, in uh, Puerto Rican liberation in an anti-colonial struggle, which is also very much a part of our present day experience. And so I think a lot about the arc of these histories in relation to uh, who we are now, where we are now, and, and how we respond to the circumstances um, of our generation. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like struggling with the unstable connection, uh, which is why my face looks crazy because I'm trying to find the internet. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering maybe if you can expand on that a bit, maybe as a segue into the For Us Bias Institution segment of our conversation, because I remember in the round table, you talked about mapping resistance and imagining an institutional home for that at El Museo, right? And really wanting to like hold the institution accountable to presenting certain histories, but mm -hmm. also feeling in some ways conflicted, right? About like uh, their capacity to kind of rise to, to the occasion. And so I'm just wondering if you can a, talk about your relationship to that particular institution, um, but B, as both like a citizen of Harlem, an artist who sees that institution as a resource, you know, like what you expect from, from that institution. Well, wow, that's, that's, that's longer than we have time for me. <laughs> but, but I will say this, that it, what was, when we did that project, I think uh, there's a couple, so they were a partner in the project. They were an institutional partner. Uh, the Met uh, was also an institutional partner uh, through my, the Civic Practice Partnership Residency um, that, that is still ongoing there. But um, uh, the, the truth of this history is that um, the history of the Young Lords is part of the history that shapes the possibility for a place like El Museo del Barrio to exist. And mm -hmm. in fact, it was shaped by some of the same people that were involved in that history. And so Mapping Resistance was a project with Iram Maristani, who is uh, uh, an amazing uh, East Harlem photographer, born and raised Puerto Rican photographer. And he was the official photographer of the Young Lords and also one of the founding members. And so in the project, for those who haven't seen it, we, 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 uh, we selected 10 images from Hiram's archive and enlarged them into billboard, billboard size images around the neighborhood at the same locations um, that those photos were taken at 50 years ago as a way of sort of moving that history forward and on location and reminding people of what happened in these streets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also reminding people that this is a living history, right? That we're still here. And um, it's, East Arm is still a Puerto Rican neighborhood, still Latinx neighborhood. And um, in spite of, you know, the, the pace of gentrification. Um, but that chapter of the Young Lord started in 69. And Museo del Barrio also starts in 1969, right? And, and what's amazing about the institutional history is that it, it's Ralph Ortiz, you know, in 69 that starts his project in a, in a, in a classroom, really, as a project um, that uh, was an idea, really, at the time. Uh, you know, there were objects on a push cart in a classroom to teach, you know, kids about Puerto Rican history because it wasn't being taught. And I think the audacity of, of, of imagining that as a museum, right, from a collection of objects on a push cart is a powerful idea. Um, but that is an idea that's shaped in, in, into an institution by Marta Morena Vega and, and uh, others that come in to uh, lead the institution uh, in the subsequent years, in the uh, early 70s. And really, it's, it's at that time that Hiram, who I mentioned as the photographer, uh, is working with El Museo del Barrio and eventually became the director of El Museo del Barrio, you know, for uh, maybe four years from the early 70s through the mid 70s. So these, there's institutional overlap, right, in all of this. And um, this is also at the time where there's this amazing uh, exhibition being forged that partners with the Met to bring Puerto Rican art from the island to the neighborhood. And that's a whole nother story. But um, what's happening is that uh, folks from our community are shaping the institutional vision for a place that will teach our history to our community, right? Um, because other institutions weren't doing that. 
right? right. Had, they had left us out for so long, right? And so that's a similar history to a Studi Museum and, and Museo de Barrio is, you know, um, uh, they're, they're like sister institutions here in Harlem. Uh, but, um, you know, that was, that's the early story that we were trying to actually uh, really highlight uh, the community foundation of that history and the way that it was so deliberately uh, sort of founded and shaped mm -hmm. in those years. And so, uh, you know, it took, it, it went in a whole different series of directions later as it expanded and mainstreamed and moved to Fifth Avenue from, you know, it was in a school, it was in a brownstone, then in a storefront location on Third Avenue and 106th, and eventually to where it is now on Fifth Avenue and uh, on 104th. Um, but when it moved to Fifth Avenue in 77, it was now uh, at the top of Museum Mile, right? The highest, uh, furthest, furthest North Museum, um, but still not yet, you know, a mainstream institution, although I think it aspired to be. And there is where, you know, various conflicts occur in its history as it sort of reaches towards this mainstream, the, the great fear is that it would marginalize the people uh, who created it and the community that founded that institution. And that uh, struggle uh, has, is an ongoing struggle still even today with the institution to keep it honest about its roots and history and, um, and its commitments to the community that created it as, is, as it also expands to incorporate larger uh, Latinx communities. Yeah. I mean, I want to summon Jamaica in at this point, because I think, you know, what I'm struck by is, and I've been asking this question more and more is like, because, you know, I have students and they're all like, burn the institution, anti-institution. And I'm like, yeah, what is an institution? You know, like literally, what are we mm -hmm. talking about? Um, mm -hmm. And I think more and more, I'm understanding it to be people, right? It's like these complex social histories. And I think there's more similarity between these kind of smaller social institutions and these like larger cultural institutions, then there are difference, right? It's like the bureaucracy is kind of what, you know, people understand in relation to these larger institutions. And so I'm just curious as someone who's like literally built a forest bias institution, right? Like the challenges of that, um, you know, the opportunities of that, like what you're carrying with you in terms of you know, how you want that space to evolve beyond your time on earth, right? Like mm -hmm. imagining a future mm -hmm. for the space that you're building. Mm -hmm. um, that's not really a question, but maybe you know what to do with it. <laughs> Let's go. Um, okay. So, you know, the, the opportunities in it are that like, so the Beautiful Project is always attracts people um, who are, um, who know what it is to be afraid, but are also like, well, why not? Let's try anyway. Um, and um, also get this kind of a moment of feeling like, um, if I don't try, I could die. Like if I don't, if I don't, if a, a part of me could um, like we just can't afford to let a part of us give up. Like what, what, what would we give up if we just let the possibility of our future go? Um, and so um, the opportunity, there is, a, there is a thrill in working with black girls and women um, who, we all just at some point in time um, in the work, like, I mean, when we started um, years ago, like I guess about, about 16 years ago now, people thought like when I started and I was um, solo for a bit, um, people just thought what I was doing was both lovely and ridiculous. Um, they had a lot of, you know, um, correcting what I just said to them. Like, oh, I want to, you know, impact, impact Black girls in photography. It's, oh, okay, what about our boys? So there was just a lot of, there was just a lot of editing whenever anyone mm -hmm. um, spoke to me. Um, and as we, we became a collective, um, as we just would not stop trying um, to create an institution, create a dream house um, where 
Black girls and women could thrive and we could together kind of cultivate voice and power. But the reality was like, we first would recognize the opportunity was this, this mirror to build a space where you could see you already had something going, like who you are and your value and your worth isn't based on a program that I could create for you or you could create for me. Um, but together, uh, man, <laughs> what we could do. Um, and so we started to redefine sisterhood for ourselves based on our ex individual experiences um, and then our collective um, definition. And I think that helps both me as a leader and as a founder and everyone in Beautiful at every phase um, have hope that, you know, if you um, submit yourself to a process, which even if it's like being brave and trying something that doesn't make any sense to anyone else, um, then maybe one of your dreams can come true and then you can work on, you know, your next one. The reality mm -hmm. is that we were interdiscipl interdisciplinary. We are interdisciplinary, um, but we brought our full selves to the beautiful project so that it was safe to be, um, it was, it's a beautiful a space where we're not, none of us are just one thing. Um, and so if that's true, then we get to do exhibitions um, outside at community centers, at our homes, um, at the Met, right? Yeah. Now that right. was like, a, that was a learning curve that we didn't, we didn't actually really know about, but um, uh, absolutely mentorship, but it was sisterhood that taught us that lesson that yeah, the Met too. Um, but we were able to get there in part because why not that community center? Why not, why not um, our homes? Why not on, online? Why not the sidewalk? Um, why not the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke? You know, like, like there were just, it, it just steamrolls into these why nots. The challenge is, is, the challenge of it is, so the opportunity is like to deepen and redefine sisterhood over and over again with a group of people um, that may not have found each other um, otherwise. One. Right. Two, um, the challenge is when you are constantly doing something where a whole lot of people's natural reaction is kind of like, this is crazy. Like, why are you even trying this? Um, you can't do this. We've, I, I've, I've heard, you can't do this. That's impossible. That will never be a job. Um, you need to focus on all girls. And by that, I mean white girls too. Right. Um, and this is like, I'm, I'm repeating verbatim the things that people have said to me throughout mm -hmm. the 16 years of um, building on our behalf. Um, and that is exhausting. Um, so the challenge is in the midst of doing something that folks find absurd um, and you low key think is like, we gotta say it's a, it's a slim shot, but we got a shot. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's exhausting, it's exhausting. Yeah. So we have to, like I, you know, I have to, the um, Beautiful Project Collective as a whole, um, we have to um, be flexible enough to create space for ourselves to heal. That's right. I mean, can I, can I jump in really quickly, Nico? Yes, I just have one thing that I have to say because it is actually a segue right to you. Um, so that exhaustion is real um, and it's important to name it because it is like an essential piece of the work. And I think part of what I'm curious to hear you talk about Shonda is like, I feel like this is where philanthropy can come in and co-opt the direction of the growth of forest bias institutions, right? It's like when we're at our most exhausted, when we're at our most depleted, um, when we're at our most in need of you know, support and resources, this can be the moment where philanthropy comes in and says, yeah, 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 I got you. But also here's a new political agenda, right? Or here's a new mission or new facet to the mission. Um, and so I'm just curious, you know, in addition to whatever else you wanted to say, how we protect the sanctity of the mission while allowing it to grow um, from this kind of movement capture by, by philanthropy. All right, really, really good question. I, I think really quickly though, I wanna just say, um, Jamaica, your point sort of about the question about, um, you know, oh, well, what about boys? 
um, and or sort of that comparative dime that really only allows you to see um, black girls, especially from this like um, like comparative place of like you know in relationship to white girls mm -hmm. or in relationship mm -hmm. to black boys, mm -hmm. really does sort of speak to me to the like the necessity and the audacity of like for us by us institutions mm -hmm. that. Um, sort of audacity that says, you know what, sort of our needs, our experiences deserve to be seen sort of just because, just for us, <laughs> that's it, for no that's other right. reason. That's right. Like, you that's know, right. not um, out to do some work to solve right. some problem, but literally just because we're dope, um, just because we're amazing. In addition to the fact that like, you know, um, usually it's sort of at the root of some political necessity, right? And so for me, it, it just like that completely sort of summed up, you know, sort of that idea for me, because I think I sort of think of um, for us by us institutions as like that quintessential room of one's own, that place where I can just go be. And I think about like work with um, Black girls in particular, um, we're consistently, we're always asking them to do a thing or to be a thing, or we're constantly trying to fix on them all the time, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your body. There's something wrong with your sexuality. There's something wrong, you know, with your test scores. And so this, you know, I think the just audacity to say, show up and talk to us, tell us a story, dream a dream for us is like the most radical thing, you know, just to just a place, what is it? Is whatever you say it is. And, you know, that for me is like part of the like, the innovation part of the like thinking about what a radical what a beautiful future can look like and sort of um you know it really sort of compels me to sort of do the work that I do but back to your question Nico about sort of thinking about how for us by us institutions start to resist that sort of um uh, mission drift that happens or you sort of movement capture um that's a hard question right and I think it's really easy to be pulled and swayed um, by philanthropic institutions who really do lack a holistic and comprehensive understanding sort of of both your community itself and the issues they face. Um, personally, I kind of related to job searching when you're absolutely broke. <laughs> you know, when you are broke. Oh, it's like whoever jumps out on the scene, you're like, yes, I do that. Sure, I do. <laughs> What's that? You know, and as you're Googling, like, what exactly is, you know, and it's like, you know, uh, for me, it's like, you know, thinking about that sort of level of agency that you have when you're resourced, you know, and thinking mm -hmm. about, you know, the ways in which, you know, you can, you know, start to, to, to think about your own agenda whenever you, um, you know, whenever you're doing it from a place of security, um, you're able to sort of think about and, um, you know, turn down opportunities that don't make sense to you. Um, from an organizational perspective, it's why the Ms. Foundation really does lean so heavily into trust-based philanthropy um, or the concept that organizations themselves are actually the, esper uh, the experts, you know, the fact that they are um, best suited to really be determining and thinking about the work that they should be doing and their orientation to that work. Um, and it's also for us the reason why we sort of lean into making multi-year um, general operating commitments so that organizations can sort of plan um, and dream and do the work that they do from a place of power you know it's like that scarcity it doesn't allow you you know I think about my my work as a mother and usually sort of organizations it's like their communities are sort of um they're their babies you know it's like you know I'm responsible for this work you know and it's like we talked about sort of early on because of our, ident our identities it's like I'm, I'm not doing this work as a hobby it's like generally sort of a, a matter of life and death and so the decisions you make um, sort of even around sort of the funding you take really are sort of are directly connected to the fact that you are actually responsible and so thinking about ways that we can sort of resource organizations better um, you know, I think about little things, Nico, like, you know, just, you know, from being a black woman in the world, you know, how you sort of, you know, you know, you have this feeling at once that you are not enough. And also, like Jamaica said, the baddest thing, her mom said the baddest <laughs> thing, walk in. Um, but also, I think this sort of like sneaky thing about sort of like structural racism sometimes is it like, it makes you be confused sort of about like, you know, is there something wrong with me? You know, is there a thing like, why don't these opportunities like show up? You know, and it's like little stuff. Like I think about, you know, resources like executive coaching. You know how many years I was out in the world figuring out things for myself, 
you know, and trying to do it, you know, to prove I deserve to be there, you know, while all the time, you know, some of my, you know, colleagues, you know, some of my, my non-POC colleagues were just, you know, out there getting coaching and getting mentorship. And I was like, the hell, I've been out here trying to figure this thing out, you know, and making these poor decisions, you know, because I think so. So, um, yeah, so just for me, it's about thinking about how do we like resource organizations? How do we resource people? How do we resource um, artists so that they can be sort of doing the work that they do and making the decisions that they need to make from a place of, of power and not from a position of scarcity? Yeah, which is why like it's so important that you're precisely where you are doing the work that you're doing with the authenticity that you do. Um, because, you know, not everyone's out there thinking that fully about the entire picture. Miguel, I saw you make a facial expression like five minutes ago. Did you want to say something? No, I'm just, I could listen to Shonda all day. <laughs> 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 we have like 10 future podcasts here, Malvika, just so you know. Um, also, I, word on the street is that we're starting a band. I don't, you know, that, that I heard are. that it's going to happen. So <laughs> that's why I wore my leather today. I was like, just so everyone knows. <laughs> but here's the question sure. what's the genre of the band like what's the music it, it doesn't it doesn't that, know it doesn't it doesn't know? even know it doesn't know yet no, this is, cool. that was good nico <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of how it all started though like not, not with the band but like you know on the court before, before. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. hey, I, I also know my way around the ball. So it's like, well, we're not like pontificating um, or, or, you know, making music, you know, we could do some three on three. So listen, just let you know. listen I talk trash like I do, but just for See, transparency, you're on say, my team. You'll be yep. scared. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna be like, let me get y'all some water. <laughs> I, I told Nico I, I would just talk about basketball on this panel basically but um I was joking <laughs> but it's actually it kind of in that metaphor because when I think about those early days that I, actually how we met and this you know it was like me and Zach February right so we play we were both underemployed had time to play ball and then we we play ball and then we go see art we'd be all busted and sweaty go into the galleries exhausted but you know then we also like knew what we wanted to see and didn't want to see right it's like right. kind of a great time to see art <laughs> um and but we'd always go to rush right and so and that's where we see you and we you know we, we talk about basketball but we also you know would look at the art so we went there because we also knew that we would see artists that we knew right artists that we felt connected to and and for me that's also kind of an important part of this right is that we, mm -hmm. we go to the places also that you know support who we are right and that reflect who we are and so and rush was one of those kinds of spaces i think that was really important in that equation and it, so it wasn't a coincidence that we you know we ended up there every time we were doing our our, our rounds it was like yeah uh, uh an important stop on the tour that's rush arts uh for those that don't know it um it's um it's Rush Arts Gallery. It's a nonprofit art gallery, one in Chelsea, one in mm, Clinton Hill, Clinton, Brooklyn. I'm just answering a question in the chat. Sorry. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. I was for a moment, <laughs> I was like, is this like a basketball court? Is this like no. a park? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an um, artist founded institution and philanthropic uh, foundation. So it's Danny and Russell Simmons. And then the gallery that I worked at was run by Derek Adams, who is an amazing artist, educator mentor of mine, um, which is maybe a segue into our closing segment on mentorship. Um, but I think it taps into what, what you're saying, Miguel, which is like, you know, how we find our way to each other, um, how we support each other, how we develop and cultivate a community of critique, even when we don't like, we're not gifted that, right? By the world or by the field. Um, and I think of that as like a form of resistance, right? Because I think about how our work is being consumed right now and the speed with which it's being consumed to the point where, you know, we're not even able to like check its value, you know, or to like have someone come in and say, you know what, boo, that's like pretty, but is that what you're trying to say in that piece? Um, and so part of what I think is like that FUBU institutions, that's like a home for those types of conversations for peer mentorship um, and for like really honest conversation around how value kind of circulates, you know, around and through our labor and our work. Um, so just want to kind of open that up um, as a general, place of exploration. Um, 
Shonda, something that we talked about in your roundtable, specifically Ruber, Ruby Lerner, uh, who's you know the founder of Creative Capital. She talked about something that was like so mind blowing to me, and I don't know why, but she was essentially like, "What is the responsibility of leadership to be cultivating the leaders of tomorrow?" You know, it's like, how do you plan your graceful exit from the seat that you've sat in for however many years or centuries, um, and then like above and beyond that, like what is your duty to the future generation in terms of, you know, providing access to your experience and to what you've learned and to how you might do things differently, you know, as someone who's navigated the field. Um, and I just love that because it felt so generous um, and it, it didn't feel transactional at all. You know, it felt like she didn't know who that leader might be, but she was open to the idea that it was her responsibility, you know, to be available to whoever it, whoever it was. So, um, Again, not a question, opening the floor. And you go, in, a, in addition to sort of just the idea um, um, that it sort of was uh, the responsibility of cultural leaders to be planning their exit, that conversation sort of, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, sort of um, also was sort of expanding the, the concept of who needs to be at the table. And, it, and, and that sort of, you know, I won't speak uh, for Ruby, but there was something really lovely sort of about the fact that um, her as, an, as a white woman sort of was contemplating sort of what is my responsibility sort of to like, not only move aside for the next generation to come up, but also, you know, who hasn't sort of had access, um, you know, to the sort of leadership opportunities that I have, who else needs to be here? And what's my uh, responsibility to sort of, um, to sort of strengthen the pipeline and sort of to think specifically about, you know, when we think about marginalized identities, when we think about why it is that sort of women of color aren't in these positions, though they're qualified, they're, they're, they're qualified and they're eager to do it. Like, why are they not here? And what do they need to be able to get here? And then to show up fully, to be able to, yeah. to not just get here and thank you, you're here now and figure it out, you're on your own. Um, but you're here um, and sort of what are the sort of resources that we can sort of wrap around you to make sure that you can be most successful, to be making sure that you then are able to sort of reach back um, and sort of be pulling people forward. You can sort of look back and you can say, but where does, what trans people in the room? We have all these conversations, you know, around the same, but what's trans people? Or, oh, okay, you know, we're doing this, this, this art, you know, around sort of low income women. What are, where are the low income women at? Right. You know, and so, you know, there was something lovely about that sort of thinking about that idea of sort of what's my responsibility here in this way, but also who else, who needs to be here? You know, and if we think about sort of our current social and political moment, sort of, you know, what is it asking of us, you know, except for to be making sure that like we use whatever sort of positional power, whatever sort of positional privilege we have to be making sure that we're creating the world we want to see. And part of that, it moves it involves sort of stepping aside and then reaching and pulling somebody forward. And like when I think about my the mentorship that I've had sort of along the way, there's you know there's been sort of the, a passive sort of mentorship, but there's also been the mentorship that sort of has looked like going and dragging me out of some place because I didn't think that I you know had enough sort of skills or that I was ready to do a thing, and literally forcing me or literally just plopping me down and surrounding me with some resources because that person sort of could see not just what I needed, but what the community needed and who was best situated to be doing that work. Yeah, this was like one of my favorite um, uh, kind of uh, moments in our conversation that uh, Nico, you, you told us that you wanted to talk about. Um, because mentorship has been so important um, in my life. And um, I loved how um, I think earlier you referenced like um, peer mentoring, but also um, like this intergenerational mentoring. And, and I, Shonda, I loved how specific you were around kind of like, you know, like somebody that, that came and said like, come here, come here, come here. Um, and so, um, there were uh, three folks that um, came to mind as these um, kind of examples in my life in this work um, of mentorship because they're so different from each other and the way they've showed up for me um, has changed my life. Um, so one is Kayla Deans. Kayla um, is um, 
Kayla started at the Beautiful Project in I think about 2011 as an intern. Um, today, Kayla is the creative director of the Beautiful Project. Boom. Like, <laughs> and, and this woman, um, how she makes the de decision not just to receive my mentorship and leadership, but um, lead me um, and dig me out um, and put my chin up and, 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 and show me the way um, has been life-changing for me. Uh, Courtney Reedy in um, is an amazing mentor. Um, she is <laughs> fantastic talented photographer, curator um, at Center for Documentary Studies at Duke. And for years, um, her office was this safe space for Black women to just show up. Um, and she would just teach me. And I remember saying to her, Courtney, there's so much I want to do. There's so much I want to curate. I just found out it was called curating, number one. <laughs> number two, I don't think I got that loop or the grades to go get a master's. She said, Jamaica, I have an undergraduate degree. What you wanna do? And I was just like, okay, okay. <laughs> Courtney, um, I think at one point in time, Courtney, like, you know, we've had, she invited us um, um, to have exhibitions there. Um, but there was one time we were just like, we're just gonna do a pop-up. It'll be totally fine. She said, no, you're gonna install it. And I said, thank you for what you're doing you know, for us. <laughs> I know what you're doing. She said, um, you're welcome and thank you. CDS should be thanking you. Mm -hmm. She said, I know who you are, right? Yeah. And then went back to her office to do work. Sandra Jackson DeMonk. Okay. So when I talked about sisterhood before mentorship, yes, and sisterhood, um, what I was referencing was this kind of beautiful, super um, in your face way that Sandra just kind of got us together. She just kind of said like, yo, like you can do this. The beautiful project deserves to be here. Um, throughout the process, Sandra um, used to be the um, chairman of education at the Met um, um, and now runs a fabulous museum in California. Look her up. <laughs> um, but, the things that she would say throughout the process as I was completely freaking out being late for labels or completely freaking out because like, oh man, where did that file go? Um, she would say, as things were developing, she would say, are you happy? How does this look to you? And it, would, it was shocking. I had to like reorient myself to think like, oh, because how I feel about this process is important. Um, it was mesmerizing. And she also, and she also would call me out over wine, just low key direct. I would give her an answer to a question and she's like, right. And it's also really difficult when you procrastinate. <laughs> that was and such I a said, good impression. <laughs> Woo, Pico! I was like, I said, yep. And then went and did my assignment. So just the ability to not, to be like the best type when, when I've, I mean, the mentorship um, for po folks your age, um, uh, younger than you, um, your elders, and just across the board um, can just be really, really powerful. And I have loved it. I have loved it. I have loved it. Yeah. Go ahead, Miguel. Uh, yeah, I, I also want to. Uh want to shout out Sandra Jackson Dumont. I mean, she is, uh, she is a friend and, and mentor to so many of us. And, uh, you know, the, the residency that I'm in at the Met right now, the Civic Practice Partnership, a residency program is, um, it started really, uh, it was her, she's the one that came up with this idea. And uh, um, she's the one that brought us in as an opportunity. Uh, and uh, the Civic Practice Partnership is, is a residency program that involves artists that um, have uh, practices that already connect to their communities, um, that are involved in social justice, uh, make socially motivated work. And um, it's a way to partner. It, it, the residency was an idea um, of, of bringing artists in to partner with the institution to think about how we could leverage the resources of, of the institution in service of the work we do in our own communities. 
and expand these relationships. And so uh, it, it started with Rashida Bumbray and I as the first cohort, Rashida Bumbray, an amazing uh, performer and uh, choreographer. Um, and now we're a cohort of five, which include Toshi Regan, a uh, musician, songwriter, composer, uh, Mei Loom, who's a community organizer at uh, Wing on Wo in Chinatown, the oldest uh, family owned business in Chinatown, and it's an artist community space. And John Gray from uh, Ghetto Gastro, the culinary and artistic collective in the Bronx. And so it's a really unique cohort of five artists across different uh, practices who are all involved in social justice and are all partnering with the institution uh, and institutional resources sort of to develop our own work. Uh, in conversation with the world and our in our communities and the institution and so it's it's all a provocation but that's just that that door, that door is open by sandra you know for us okay. and i yeah. think that's significant because i've never forgotten that like what it means for uh to open doors right and to in, 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 enable and empower opportunities uh that, that potentially can be transformational right what does it mean um, this work that we do uh, it, as we involve others to do it with us. And so, and I think that's a charge that I think about a lot in the work that I do as a way of also sort of, uh, it's an, an ethic that I'm determined to continue to practice and pass on and open up um, wherever I'm at. Yeah, it's funny. So Sandra is the, um, the final interview for the book. She talks about thought leadership um, and just kind of like how you live equity as a daily practice. It's not like a thing that you pay people to come tell you how to do. It's like, how do you show up every day in your institution with that as your kind of mantle? Um, and she mentions you, Miguel. She, she was talking about like, just being so excited by the ways in which she could imagine you kind of moving around the different spaces of the Met. Um, and like the FOB is this kind of um, object that holds all this you know, kind of sense of access and power and she's like, yeah, it's important that artists be able to like have this sense that this entire institution is open to them, that we're actually here to serve their ideas. And so part of my role is just to remind the artist that like it's open to them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I mean, that's just such a simple and powerful kind of statement, but it's like in every space that she is in, it's like she shows up like that. Um, and I just wanna, two things, we're gonna transition to q and I think I see Malvika move in a little like this. Um, yep. And I just want to shout out one of my very own mentors who is here in the room, Thursda Goody, um, who is the former editor for Art Scene at The Rail. Um, yeah, and just being super excited, A, to have you here, but B, to have you, you know, as my mentor, as someone who's really helped me to kind of reclaim writing as a practice that is both creative and critical and generative and not a thing that other people assign to you. Um, so thank you. I love you. I see you. And thank you for, you know, really giving this platform uh, space. So with that, shall we open up the floor? May I respond? Of course. Hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a just what you guys are all great. I mean, I just feel like I'm like lifting off the, the, the earth, but Nico, um, I now have language, you know, you, uh, you, uh, this conversation has given me language. Step aside, then reach and pull. And, mm. and, and, and you have been so much that for me. And that's what I, I tried in my little way when I was at the Brooklyn Rail. But now I feel, um, I feel like you're my teacher too, right? The mentor oh. mentee thing goes back and forth. Um, um, generationally, racially, all sorts of ideas. Um, so I, I feel very blessed to be here and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aww. Love you. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> this is like really a Friday mood for me. So we have a couple questions lined up, but I, I'd okay. love to sort of take the opportunity if anyone of your panelists have a question, you know, that they've been dying to ask you or each other, if anyone has something. I, I do have one question, sort of thinking on, on sort of the occasion while we're gathered. I want to know what art books you're reading. Um, I, for me, I, one of the most impactful ones that I've sort of picked up recently, too. Well, there's so many, um, <laughs> but uh, definitely <laughs> Marking Time. Um, mm. Nicole Fleetwood 
has sort of been one of the most sort of for me sort of like revolutionary and thinking about sort of my thinking in just my personal identity as someone who is a survivor of the justice system um mm -hmm. sort of seeing the way how beautifully um curated that exhibition was and sort of the and the sort of intent intentionality sort of within how those stories were sort of captured um yeah it's just so powerful so if you haven't um seen it or read it get into it yeah um, I'm gonna grab this. Uh, oh. uh, 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 Black Futures, Kimberly Drew, Jenna Wortham. Hey. Um, I, uh, shout out to um, Dr. Erin Stevens, program director from the Beautiful Project, and my friend. And at the end of the year, she <laughs> said, Jamaica deserves this book, and mailed it to me, and I screamed. And so I keep it on my desk and I read it um, several times a week. So, like Sean, if you get into it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, hear yours. I'm just going to grab the book next to me. It's not necessarily an art book, but it is. Can you see this? Yeah. So, uh, Mabel Wilson, architect, professor, just like general, all around brilliant human being in the world. Um, I haven't actually opened it yet, but I, I'm like two pages into the introduction, so I'll let you know. But I just love the way that she thinks about the intersections of race and space and place. OK. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's go to audience Q&A. Our first lovely question will come from Jess Chan. Jess, you can turn on your microphone now. All right, awesome. Well, first of all, thank you all so much for speaking today. There's so much warmth and energy in this conversation. I really love it. Uh, my question has to do with institutions. This came to mind when Nico mentioned her students, but what is the best or maybe unexpected argument or perspective you've heard as to why we should burn all institutions down? And on the flip side, what is the best argument or perspective you've heard as to why and how we should save them? Yeah, I'm like, can we have a whole other two hours? <laughs> That's huge. Um, I can I can share what I've heard. Um, so young woman getting a PhD, um, invited her to write alongside me uh, for a kind of digital publication that's coming out next week. Um, you know, and it's an invitation to kind of like brainstorm how cultural institutions could do things differently. And yeah, she was like, uh, I like you, but I'm not interested in the exercise. Um, and I was like, yeah, but it's a blank piece of paper. Like you could do whatever you want, you know, like sh tell me how you want to burn it down. And she was basically like, I don't want to put any more energy towards trying to fix this broken thing, right? Like, I know the things I care about. I know where I want to spend my time and my energy. And it's not trying to rethink institutions. And, you know, I like totally respected it. I was like, yep, of course. Thank you for your time. And, you know, go do the thing that brings you joy. Um, and so I think, yeah, that to me is like maybe an answer to both, right? Which is like, burn it down by just no longer investing energy and resources and time towards trying to fix it. Um, yeah. It, it's interesting. I sort of, you know, when I think about the sort of movement work that I do, the idea of sort of abolishing institutions is sort of like central to sort of the work that I do and sort of some of the frameworks that I hold. And while there are certainly some institutions that I think have to just go, we completely have to reimagine um, you know, thinking about uh, sort of institutions of like punishment, sort of thinking about the ways that we do education. There are also institutions that, um, you know, I, okay, let me back up two seconds. I, sometimes I think about the, the sort of idea, you know, aside from some of those that I just um, mentioned, the sort of idea that we got to burn every damn thing down is some real angsty millennial shit <laughs> that I'm like, what is wrong? these people um you know and I, that tells you how old i am sometimes it's like because i now i'm looking back and i'm like what's wrong what's wrong with and do what <laughs> folks you know and replace it with what when you know we, we spend so much energy into thinking about how to tear shit down 
and like very little energy about how to create new things right. and build things and sort of actual what a real future would look like, what needs to go into it. And so like part of me, um, you know, would really wish we spent more energy on the idea of sort of building new or and sort of relevant institutions, much in the same way that we think about stepping aside, you know, so, so that new cultural leaders can happen. Um, I think that, you know, there are new institutions, like I think about the relevance of, say, the Black church and sort of what role it, the Black church played in sort of, you know, building community, sort of being a, a sort of a spiritual and political home for Black people, you know, and it's like, at the same time, I can hold how much harm it has sort of has caused and how we need something else, especially sort of in the, the vacuum or the fact that our sort of the moment we are in now are sort of like it's calling us to something different. But there's just something about sort of my upbringing and the way that I'm set up that sort of still allows me to revere sort of that institution and sort of what it did and what it meant, you know, and, and be able to think, okay, now we need something else and really focus attention on like, what do we need now? And how do we go get it? You know, so yeah, I think that's the kind of a lot of things, you know, and it's not to be dismissive, you know, of what you're saying. It's part of, it's old and crotchety a little bit. And it's just like, you know, I have little patience sometimes, but like I really do want to focus more energy on the dream um, than on the the act of like tearing everything down. Yeah. I I want to follow up on that. That's Sean. That's amazing. Like the uh, I think the arc of history is important, you know, and thinking about the role we play in 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 the history that we live in, right? You know, is is also something that comes to mind. Like. Um, I get, I use a Museo del Barrio as an example, right? It, you know, it's a place that when I was a young artist, you know, uh, still in school, uh, I didn't even live in New York at the time. I was visiting New York. It, I would come to East Harlem to visit, right? Why? Because they had two institutions that had Puerto Rican art, right? And they were the only two I knew about in the United States, the Taller Boricua and the Museo del Barrio. And when I would go to those institutions is the only place I could see Puerto Rican art in a museum, right? And I never forget that, like it changed my life. It, it shaped my whole uh, artistic life and gave me influences that I have to this day. It introduced me to people like Juan Sanchez and Pepe Osorio who became lifelong friends and mentors, right? And I, I never forget the, how important that experience was for me as a young artist, right? Um, and then eventually I would move to New York and uh, go to the museum and used to, used to drop off slides, you know, for a slide registry. Uh, and, and so this woman named Annie worked at the gift shop in the bookstore, right? And, and so she would take the slides. Annie was Dominican, she was young, she was super friendly all the time and made me feel welcome, right? And for me, she was the face of the museum. She's the only person that I knew, right? As a humble young artist who I dropped off slides. Years later, I'd get into the museum and the show, get into the collection, et cetera, and feel like, you know, a, a stakeholder in the, in the institution's uh, community. Um, today, but at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a very fraught history, right? And you recognize all the problems that it's had with leadership and board and different directions that it's tried to go in. And throughout its history, it has, it's been the community that has fought to keep it honest, right? And to keep it uh, with integrity to its mission, right? And this battle back and forth between the, the, the struggle of a community-based institution growing into the, this sort of mainstream space that in its past has deliberately whitewashed some of this history, right? And so we're in a, di a different moment right now uh, where it, with all, the, all these same issues are still being uh, completely uh, presented again and foregrounded again. And um, you know, I'm part of a community uh, advisory committee now that is, is still pressuring the institution to, to um, stay honest to its mission, right? But also what's happened in, in this, this time is like, they, they, we just lost like the registrar there, right? Who was the caretaker for 20 something years, mm -hmm. longest uh, employee in its institutional history, right? One of the few Puerto Ricans still on staff in the museum that was founded by Puerto Ricans from East Harlem, right? Mm -hmm. um, wow. At the Center for Puerto, Rico, for Puerto Rican Studies of Hunter College, we just lost the, the chief archivist who's retiring also. Both of them are retiring, right? The archivist, these are the caretakers of our history of the collections of these institutions whose historic memory goes back further than anybody else's in those spaces. And so what concerns me, this goes back to the question of sort of mentorship, right? And sort of like mentoring in another generation to understand these legacies and these values is that our histories are vulnerable, right? In a lot of these spaces. 
And it's so it's, I, I feel like it's incumbent upon us to be involved, right? And to be honest and critical voices. Um, and it's, and that's, that's just uh, part of what I think we have to do. So it's like one of the many hats. It's not fun work all the time, but it's necessary work. And so, you know, part of what I'm determined to, to, uh, uh, to make happen is like, you know, someone can be a kid like I was and have that experience in this institution as a young artist and be radically transformed by artists that they feel represented by, that they feel are speaking to them about who they are and their history, et cetera. And um, so it's, it, it's just part of the reason I stay involved as difficult as the work is. And it's, it's, um, it's the constant work, you know, it's the constant work. That's right. Some of, um, Nico, is that, that's okay if I jump in? Of course. Um, so the best, and this is, this is a kind of a thread from what you all shared um, but the best uh, I've heard um, comes from little black girls and typically sounds like Miss Jamaica, I'm not doing that. And it's like, <laughs> yo, okay, why? And so, so there's like this mixture of, it's really interesting. It's, it's, it's like, like the authority and expertise that comes out in Miss Jamaica, I'm not doing that. Um, and the opportunity to find out why um, is when I find out um, who wants to burn it down and why, um, where they've identified their own power and why, um, where they've identified um, that there is gargantuan resistance to their power um, and to their influence, um, who wants to keep it, but it can't stay this way, right? And so, I have like, is one of the reasons why like Shada and I enjoy each other. Like, like I, we're, we, we can just, we, we marry each other so much. Like I hear little black girls who talk like Shonda. They say what she says by saying, Mr. Maker, I'm not doing that. Now I got to go to school, okay? But this, this, and this has got to go. What say you, you know? And so then, so it's like this really interesting um, to me, when you ask that question, it's a really interesting critique that I've heard and that sticks with me the most because there is this um, uh, clarity around value and ben what's beneficial for my life, right? Like how can these institutions and how are institutions supposed to support me um, and also what's missing and the fact that I don't have time to just have nothing right now. Like I don't have, I don't actually in my everyday life have time to burn this down completely without having a plan in place for the rebuild, right? And so, shout out to Shonda. Little black <laughs> I guess I have a question I wanna push back, not push back, but push forward uh, and get your take on here. But I, I guess I've been wondering, how do you go about building a for us, by us institution? And you know, if it is something that one could build out of failed institutions or like majority established institutions or, you know, the impression I get is that that's fundamentally not compatible with like the kind of liberational work that we're maybe trying to accomplish in a for us by ins institution, but then, you know, and I'm, I'm all for like shifting value, shifting resources back into the places where we're embedded, established, like that's where I think the work is. I feel like I, I give the, the speech about burning down the Met, like I feel like I give that speech once a week. Um, but then also, you know, I feel like I'm reconciling with the tension that, like, I, you know, I do have to repair and restore in the social relations that I already have, the structures I already have, and like, you know, like, can, like, is it possible to make, to alter an institution from the interior, or is it just not worth it? It's interesting. I'm one who's a yes and. I, the answer, my answer to yeah. that question is yes. <laughs> yes, all the things, right? <laughs> and it's like, I think that it's like, my grandma used to say something like, it takes all kinds, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, anybody else, grandma? Jamaica, your grandma, you say it takes all kinds? <laughs> yeah. Right? And usually that was pejorative. She used to mean that it took crazy folks. It meant, the, you know, the little all forms <laughs> to the side that everybody was necessary, right? Um, you know, but like, there's something, um, I think, important. There's an important lesson there that like, we got to be doing all the things, right? Especially for like communities who are marginalized. We don't have the luxury of just single, uh, of a single sort of um, strategy. Right. So it's like I think about people like uh, Jamaica, who like literally is creating an alternative institution completely like we're doing something else all the way over there. Me, I'm on the inside. I'm the, I'm the inside struggle. Right. I'm like, how what are the ways that I can be subversive inside the system? And it's like being in philanthropy for me is sort of like um, is antithetical to like my values in many ways, but also I know that like organizations need resources like right now, right? And then they also need to have somebody at the table to influence people that have control over resources to shift them to other places to sort of be the buffer, you know, to be the one to say, you know, whenever they're bumping against these structures to sort of like to block, to pass for them, you know, sort of, you know, and, and so I think that um, that's a sort of a long windy way to say, oh, we need to do all of these things, right? And this, you know, for communities who have direct needs at this moment, we need to be, at the same time, we're thinking about how to tear institutions down. We need to be thinking about, but what do we need in place? Who's gonna suffer if we wipe this all the way off? You know, what are the ways that we can reimagine? What are the ways that we can be building up something that's sustainable um, while we're working on dismantling this other thing? Yes. It's exactly that. Um, it's yes and for me too, right? It's like uh, I built my entire career inside museums and I'm not a museum person. <laughs> you know, I entered that space for the mission and for the love of, you know, black people, right? I'm talking about the studio museum. Um, but yeah, I entered there as a spy. Like I wanted to learn how the systems were built, what worked, what didn't work, you know, and so that I could take that and then build the thing in the image that actually serves the community in the way that I'm interested in. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's it's exactly what you said, Chanda, which is like the work is ginormous and it takes place, you know, in multiple spaces and multiple platforms. And it reminds me kind of of how we were talking about activism, right? And like whether or not we identify as someone actively engaged in dismantling the thing in a visible way, or if perhaps our work is kind of rooted in a more invisible space. And so, yeah, I think it's um, the answer is like whatever you're up for, right? Because it's exhausting, arduous work. It is, but I, I want to also recognize that the the, um, the folks like the unsung voices within those institutions sometimes that are trying to do good work, and for like uh, for myself, like many artists, like the the access we have to institutions often is through the education programs first, you know, public programs, mm -hmm. and it's the folks that I've met uh, in public programs and education that are doing the most radical work, like always, you know, and. Um, and they're often the least supported and are the most underrepresented voices in the institution. Uh, but that's for me where the strongest relationships have been. And um, you know, my, my residency at the Met right now is through education. You know, the Civic Practice Partnership is a project that operates through education. And there are a lot of amazing people in education that I love working with um, who are really trying to do radical work at the institution. Um, you know, the same is true, whether it's Mosel Barrio or, or the Met, there's, there's always been good people inside trying to do good work um, that are often sort of like, you know, meet in conflict with the values or the goals of administrations or board, et cetera. So it's, 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 I think, more complicated, you know, always, you know, internally, but there are different ways that, that people are trying to do this work, I think, on the inside and the outside, you know, and so there's, there's always, you know, we always have, uh, allies, you know, in different spaces as well. And I think it's just, it's more nuanced. It's more nuanced. Uh, yeah. And I think something that's really important to recognize right now is that the culture shifted this past year, right? And so, you know, it's like the last summer's uh, uprisings for racial justice in this country and around the world really have, have, have created a different kind of consciousness institutionally that people, that they're often awkwardly trying to respond to museums, but it does present some opportunities, right, for uh, more radical sort of positions to come forward from our communities, right, from activists, from educators, from artists, et cetera. And we're seeing that, we're seeing 
right. some of that happened and hopefully it's not just momentary, right? Part of this is keeping the pressure on for this to be a, a transformational shift that's, uh, that's significant. Uh, but that's work is incumbent upon all of us too, you know, to keep that pressure on. Yeah, I think I think so much of what you said is is very much what I was kind of asking about and asking for advice about. Um, Nico, I love what you said about you know being in the museums for your career, and that you entered there as a spy, and it reminded me of sort of the organizer and reproductive justice activist um, Loretta Ross, who who you know says like you'll see me in a suit, right? You'll see me in the suit in the courthouse, and it's because I'm in disguise. Um, I feel like that's very much what I was. I guess what I'm kind of chewing on these days. Um, but thank you for those answers and those strategies. Our next question will come from actually my mentor, Sheila Pepe. Uh, so Sheila, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hi. Um, so I, you opened this meeting with so much love like an unbelievably welcome amount of love and, and affirmation. And, um, you know, it reminds me that the art world world that I grew up in um, was always oriented in this very competitive way. And what I think of as a very white, straight, like heterosexist idea of like getting, competing for the man, however you want to see the man. Uh -huh. And um, so I just wonder how watching the relationships among all of you, um, how competition functions in your life, um, how present it is and how you just experience it. I don't, uh, it's very kind of fundamental, not literally, but just, I mean, we all do literally, but I don't know how pre present it is in your lives. Yeah, it's actually something I've been talking about a lot recently. Um, and I don't know what that means. I'm not starting the conversation, but I find myself engaged in it. Um, yeah, and, you know, I think about all the ways as like black and brown people in the world, you know, we're trained that we have to be excellent as like survival, right? Like it's not even like be excellent because I want you to be excellent. It's like, if you're not excellent, your life is at risk. And I think there's something in that, right? Like I think there's ways in which then we begin to think that we have to be able to be all things to all people or that we are even capable of having all the skills, which is just not true, right? Like I, I know very few people that can literally do something top to bottom. It's like, we rely on each other, we're social beings. There's things that we're constantly learning from our surroundings and from other people. And so if you're able to kind of like unlearn all this stuff and all the ways in which you're trained to like see yourself as an island, then you're able to actually look at people and say, wow, that's like not a competitor, that's a collaborator because look at how they write, look at how they move, look at how they do any of these things that like, I can't do that. <laughs> and it actually benefits both of us to, to come together, right? And to like really just kind of share in each other's talent. Um, and so I think that, yeah, collaboration is like, it's just so powerful. And I think that you see it more and more, I think, you know, in the ways that artists are trying to work together in these larger scale projects. Um, but I would just love to see more collaboration across sectors. Like I think there's so much that other fields can learn from the arts and from artists. And I don't know how we open up those kind of avenues, but that feels like crucial. Um, and for me, that's really part of why the book ends on this kind of collective impact models for social justice. It's realizing we can't do it all ourselves, but we have a lot of the strategies. Um, and so let's share those as tools, right? I'm curious to know what y'all think. So one of the things that has been important for um, me and one of the things I've learned and seen, like we just like can't be afraid of the, like acknowledging, like not being afraid of the fact that um, it's possible for you to be jealous, that you will feel jealous. Like that, that feel like that there's something someone else has that you can want, like just a basic level, like, and I really, I would like, I would like that as well, right? And, and, and also trying to understand what it's about for yourself. And it, it kind of gifts us with this ability to have really real conversations when we feel attention. Um, and it shifted a lot of the ways that I've been able to work with people 
um, bringing in what was very personal for me, like in my family, like in my family, you had opportunities to be jealous. Like my sister is fly. My mom was dope. Sure, me too. But in the rotation of that experience of trying to figure out like, they have this, I do not. What does that mean for me? Does that mean I don't have, does it, is it a statement around my value? Like, what is it? So wrestling with as an individual and then um, building beautiful in a way that who we are fully belongs um, and being able to have people that understand the nuance of like, you know, just being like a, a, a full person. So there's a way that like, you know, as an individual practice, um, I have learned how to check myself if I actually feel the feeling of jealousy. Like, what is it about? Like, if, if when your mentality starts to shift to a, a place of competition, I think Nico is exactly right, right? So some of this wasn't um, necessarily created by me, um, uh, but I want to cultivate in a very specific way. Even, even in the face of um, how this world was built, right? And so um, I think you, for me, when I have practiced that enough, facing my own stuff, as opposed to my fantastic wisdom on somebody, how, how somebody else is feeling and why they do what they do. Um, but if I can also face my own stuff um, and the fact that I'm wise and intuitive and I can see, um, and mix, mix those two, then honestly, you, you can find people along the way who just kind of can either clearly or succinct or um, uh, who can, whether it is a look, um, whether it is sheer poetry or whether they are specific, can just say like, yo, you, you got this and we are gonna be all right. And I see you, you just did some good work there. Um, and I see said person did not, but we gonna be all right. Like, like if, if you have that practice enough, I have had that practice enough throughout, um, you know, what I deem a successful collaborations um, to understand uh, that I still wanna keep trying. Thank you. Um, I just, can I just follow up? Um, related to this, I think, is some things that each of you said about uh, men mentoring and having been mentored. And I think is something many people across many lines, including, um, I, I'm assuming, including race, is when, when you come from a place that doesn't have access to knowledge about any system, my father had a seventh grade education, right? We passed, but we passed differently. And you gr grow up ignorant of what you don't know. But, you know, you, 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 you know, for me, walked on and tried to sort it out, whatever. But this thing of finding a mentor or knowing you need one or there would be one feels like in the last 30 years has just um, exploded. Like before that, I don't think you'd ever ask. Like, I know I used to sit around and think, well, who would I ask? Even though I had access to amazing amounts of things. And for some reason, I think your leadership has made this topics open to talking about it, which I just am so grateful for because you sort it out on your own terms. It's, it, that's all I can imagine. So I just wanna thank you so much because it's, it's um, really affirming for me to think about the questions I had were stupid questions, right? Because I didn't, I'm gonna cry. I didn't know better and I thought I should, right? So I just wanna thank you so much for your leadership, it's really, it's so impactful. Thank you. I thank just you. want to respond briefly to what you're saying. Um, one, thank you for the concept. Thank you for the question and the uh, sort of the um, the opportunity to think about it. Um, and I'll weave in probably both your of your questions sort of in sort of what is inspiring me to thought as you sort of you were talking. 
Um, and it's interesting because the idea of competition um, is an ill fit sort of for this portion of my life. And it's sort of related to the fact that like, I like you, I have a, one of my parents is, one of my parents at this point is probably, she's barely literate, you know, but a really sort of crucial sort of, poor, you know, part of my life. Um, and so I've had to figure out sort of how to navigate all of these various systems. And the sort of um, inherent in that is sort of the idea of aspiration, the idea of I didn't even know what to ask for, or the fact that that was a thing. And so that is for me, one of the really crucial sort of roles of mentorship for me is sort of the inspiring, you know, or the, the ability to inspire and to aspire, right? And so, um, you know, those are some major things, to, you know, where mentors have been like, you need to do X, you should do that, or you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> You know, our layout of, I've had to redream my dreams so many times at this point, yeah. you know, I've like achieved a thing and they were like, that was absolutely not big enough. And I'm like, what the hell? Who even thought that was a thing? <laughs> wow. You know? And so it's like, it's, it's lovely. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, sort of the, the, sort of the, the other thing that I, um, um, sort of want to just sort of point to for me is the fact that, um, along the way, like when I say no competition, like I see things that I want to have and it's not because I don't want you to have them. I also want to have them. Right. And so it's like that, like, okay, so now can we, how can we all have them? And not only do I want to have them, I also want my other home girl to have them. So, Hey girl, did you know this is a thing? Come, we should all have these things. And so like, literally that's how like that peer mentorship. And if I could even go so far as to say beyond mentorship or peer mentorship, sisterhood has shown up for me. And I have sisterhood with like, with some men too, you know, it's like a very specific thing that says, that's good. Charlotte. We gonna all win, all of us. Her, her, her. Who ain't even thinking about it. We're gonna all get together, and we're like totally gonna win. So, thanks again. I just wanted to like, you know, I just I thought it was a lovely concept, and wanted to be able to expound upon it a little bit. Love that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Before we leave this entirely, Sheila, thank you so much. And uh, the. Um, I just wanted to make a connection between this uh, idea of uh, mentorship and competition, it, because I think they might relate to each other in some ways that in the past, like especially previous generations uh, endured such a scarcity of resources that there was often competition over very few resources, right? That created very you know, fraught relationships and in competition that was kind of the demise of, of a lot of our uh, community spaces. And um, it didn't sort of, it wasn't, uh, supportive of creating a healthy system of mentorship for future generations. But in spite of that, you know, um, many of us were lucky to find them, right, somehow. And so I, I mentioned Juan Sanchez and Pepo Nosorio earlier because they were those people for me, you know. Um, but it's also that um, these were folks who were uh, sought out because of what their work represented, right, not because of how successful they were in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And or 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 how you know uh, frequently their works were exhibited in different uh, institutions, right? Because over time, that's the work has uh, of the people that I care about the most has often been very infrequently exhibited, and right. um, and so it's um, nevertheless like I think that's still a, a, an ongoing challenge, right? That when when the market the market interests come into place is when there is a different kind of, uh, when money's involved, right? There's a different kind of tension around these issues and subjects that don't exist when you remove that from the equation oftentimes. So it's just, I mean, I think that's part of the reality as well. And, uh, you know, cause uh, our generation, I think is struggling with different things, but we, we, uh, we're, we're uh, I feel like there is a healthier energy in general in the current generation that wants to find ways of supporting each other. So at least that's what I've been my experience, you know, and I, I, it's healthy. And I think younger people, even more so perhaps, um, and maybe that's hopeful for the idea of alternative kinds of spaces emerging, you know. Yeah. I love that answer. Um, Thank you all so much. Uh, we had uh, a very interesting question come in from Charles Schultz, our managing editor, but he had to run to pick up his kiddos from school. So 
I'll hopefully maybe forward that along to you at a later date so you can pick up that conversation. But our last question will come from our very own publisher and the captain of this fine ship, Fang Bui. And Fang hey. Hey, Fang, you should be able hey. to turn on your mic hey. now. Thank you, guys. Hi. I feel like we should do a drum roll. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Nico. Hello, Jamaica. Miguel. Hi. Wonder. Thank you so much, you guys. I, uh, I'm working on the editorial for our River Rail, Puerto Rico, a dedication to our friends there. Um, so I'm steep in thinking about ways to bring the community there and then our community here. So I, it just a very rich, like I'm, I'm, I'm with my friend Sheila who just thank you guys for this uh, conversation. So I have this, uh, I'm reading two books now, which is very much uh, what you guys talking about. One is Sarah Lewis, who I already mm -hmm. interviewed interview her 2015 when the book came out it's all about failure it's a terrific book and she'll be coming on our NFT soon and the other one is uh it's called unlearning with hannah hannah Harren. uh it's terrific by marie louis not the idea is to solemnly take in her theme of broken tradition of western philosophic and political thought and how to mobilize it with a certain courage, you know, to think without the need resting on the handrail, to think without the banister, which is what the artists, creative people do best. And in regarding to your remark earlier, uh, Nico, when you began, you know, the, the, our right to criticize, you know, in institution with and without, uh, from within and from distant, it reminds the famous James Bowen quote, where he say, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Mm -hmm. And Bowen also says something very profound about education. He said the pattern of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious one begins to examine the exactly, precisely in which one is being educated. So it's, it both, it, you know, it relates to what we are all doing. We have to think out of the box. We have to get away from that convention that, you know, that machinery, uh, which um, capitalism does so well. It intensifies speed instead of allowing for slowness to think, to digest. That also relate to um, the mentorship. You know, the idea of America can't wait to send people who reach 67 to elderly home center. We never get to see our grandparents yeah. who's able to uh, give us wisdom to storytelling, you know, and see them frequently. I. Um, we, I talked with Jason Moran the other day, and Jason and I are very invested. What we, most of us at the rail do, the idea of mentorship, meaning that you have to reach out to these people. You know, the, the elderly have amazing storytelling, which is exactly what Tori Morrison once say, from the very beginning of our childhood, one phrase begin with once upon the time, you know? How do we build our history? That wisdom that they have before us, but we won't get it until we, we look, we go out of to our way to, to see them, to reach out of them. I mean, that's exactly what Jason did with, you know, uh, Milford Gray, who just passed recently away in, you know, mm -hmm. just uh, last month, just like a week before his show ended at the IC in Philadelphia. So the rail is really that. I mean, we've been tortured for so long. Why we don't have a mission statement? Who reached the Brooklyn Rail? You know, we resist all of that obvious, um, you know, can canonized uh, given mission statement because people, when they get your they still mission statement, they don't come visit you. Mm -hmm. And they pigeonhole you immediately, you know? 
So the, the, there's no tactic here, but it, is, it may be perhaps we can think of it as a strategy, but community of like-minded people like us need to get to, together more frequently so we can support and share knowledge and insight and whatever else, enthusiasm, excitement, uh, and that's where it can begin because we can't really work and be subversive within the context of bureaucracy. We have to mm. think out of it. So I'm, I'm, I'm like Sheila, super grateful, you know, to you guys. <laughs> Maybe part two is coming somewhere. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just terrific. So, you know, again, Teresa to you, Nico, and then we are talking about that tying it together to, to switch. I remember my grandmother once say, a, a, a wise young, a, a great young, wise person, have a great young person, have an old soul, remember? But then at some point, a great older person have a young soul. They meet together <laughs> and they switch. And we love hanging out with older people who have the young souls. You guys know that. So, yeah. so thank you, you guys. Uh, thank you, Jamaica. Thank you, Miguel, Wanda, and Nico. Back to you, Malvika. Thank you, Fong, for those beautiful thoughts. Um, so I think we've come to poetry hour. Uh, so at the rail, we've always had a tradition of ending our lunches with a poem. And I hesitate to say silver lining, but one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that since physical distance is less of a barrier, uh, I get to invite actual living poets and writers to share their work with us. So I have the pleasure of welcoming today's poet laureate, Sadia Hassan to the stage. Give it up for Sadia. She's the author of Enumeration, which came out with Akakshik Books. 2020. She's part of the new generation of African poets, a chapbook set, and she's the winner of the 2020 Hurston Wright College Writers Award and was, has received fellowships from Hedgebrook, Mesa Refuge, and Vona. Uh, more of her work can be found shortly in the chat links and also in the American Academy of Poetry, Boston Review, The Rumpus, Long Reads, and more. Give it up for Sadia. And Sadia, you should be able to turn on your mic. Hey. Oh my goodness. Hi. Hi, everyone. It was so wonderful to just listen on this conversation about art, about dreaming, about futures, and especially about Black girls, right? Um, I didn't know that the beautiful project exists. I think I would have loved it as a young person. And so I'm thankful that it exists for young folks out there now. Um, and if it's okay, I want to read two poems, um, a catalog of praise, and then a poem um, just about missing sisters and being messy that I wrote recently. So I'll go ahead. Um, this is from my chat book, um, Enumeration. I'm really proud of it. Um, but yes, a catalog of praise. Praise the coffee shop one block up from the crib and praise the black barista in purple with a newborn and up at seven making white folks coffee. Praise her sister's bald head shining and liner cut crisper than a mug and praise the laugh skipping like a record and the mug chipped from the weak shelf of the startup that stole my two good years and praise the two good years, however they found me, sweet or unsweet and praise my daddy for calling me sweetness and praise my daddy for pilfering sugar. And praise my daddy for refusing silence. And praise my daddy for edging mother towards a gentle hello. And good on her for trusting I would return to the table and rise from the bed. Praise the bed. And these days the table set with tea and the one succulent I almost killed leaning long tongued towards me and not the sun. And praise the viridescent and decaying heavy. Praise the air between these lungs and the funk between these pits. Praise my name, Ya Allah. Praise my lips, hips and eye sockets for beholding another day. Praise the days for keeping on coming. 
praise the good earth and the night terrors and the wonders of a small cup of coffee and one chocolate croissant. One of my favorite poems, okay. And then, where is this poem? Everything is on the internet nowadays. Um, yes. Self-portrait with cumin, saffron, and star anise after Safia El Hio. I pledge allegiance to sisters, to the wild squeal of a secret over telephone wires, the long stare between head tilt and cackle, lipstick on the hem of a skirt, gym shorts souring the sheets, earbuds mixed up good with the keys and the cards in the underwear drawer. And to the underwear drawer, which is now a makeup drawer, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the superior wrist flick, the tender tremble of an eyelash upon ink dressing, thumb licked and charmed against slips, dips, or worse, a dash too blunt for the crease. And to the smooth stroke after, I pledge an allegiance of color, glazed sugar, cabaret, gold gleam, blunt in the bathroom to smoke up the street, rustle of coats, clamor of boots, hush of wintry, oh, sorry, Huts, hush of palms, hustling heat from wintry air. To cumin, saffron, and star anise, sisters of the roasted goat and rice ritual, daughters of smoke and gossip, glowing and blood warm, allegiant to nothing but the fans, whirling dervish, I pledge to you, the pleasure of what needs doing after. Thank you all for having me. Thank you so much. Those are beautiful. Absolutely. Thank you thank so you. much, Sadia. Um, and thank you to you, Nico, Miguel, uh, Shonda, and Jamaica. And of course, thank you to all of you who tuned in today in the audience in the chat. Um, we're celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary this year, so please consider making a contribution to our anniversary, oh, anniversary fundraising campaign to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. Um, and please join us again tomorrow when we'll be joined by artist Richard Kraft alongside poet and translator Monica de la Torre for a conversation on uh, Richard's newest book project, It Is What It Is. I can identify with that. Uh, that will be as always at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Um, other than that, you can now turn on your microphones. I'm gonna send you all a little invitation to turn on your microphones uh, so we can kind of chit chat as we exit or before we exit. But thank you all so much. This was um, like a, my, a master course in, in mystique. <laughs> like, just like so good. Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.